I believe we can be more human if we accept more than one reality. In February 2015, something happened. It had a divisive impact on the world. People said it challenged their objective truth. Time magazine said it changed the course of internet history forever. I like to call it a fashion disagreement. <laughs> <laughs> but there's something more important about this. We have a really hard time accepting that we experience the physical world differently. Many of you remember the image of this dress. A lot of us see it differently. Some people see it as white and gold. Some people see it as blue and black. I happen to see it as white and gold. Turns out I'm wrong. The color you can go buy in the store is actually blue and black. But it's not about the actual color of the dress. That's not what matters. What matters is how our brain perceives the color in this image. People have looked at things like demographics, whether you, that drive these differences. Does it matter if you're a boy or a girl, young or old, or what kind of lighting environments you've spent time in? And at the core of all of these is that how we experience the world, your brain is constantly integrating information about your life's experiences, in this case, about luminous shadow and color, to make probabilistic decisions. And it turns out that we all have slightly different information going into that equation. So I can bias you if I change the context to see this image differently. Hopefully, maybe we see it differently now, but I can also take it away. And hopefully now we all see it the same. These kinds of perceptual malleabilities happen all the time. So I'm hoping we can take some time and think about where there's power and opportunity in understanding these differences. I'm going to tell you some stories. Some are personal. Some are about art. Some are about immersive technologies. But they're all about the power of gaining empathy to each other's experiences. That if we can understand how we can see, hear, and feel the exact same information in the world in entirely different ways, we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity and chance to move away from all of the dehumanization that people talk about and rehumanize our interactions and the technologies we build and use to do this. I've been a violinist since I was three. I was nine the first time I knew my, I heard the world a little differently. I always assumed everyone knew my refrigerator hummed a B flat, could write down the notes of a song, or was like really uncomfortable if happy birthday didn't start on a D. Um, I have absolute pitch, not particularly unique in this way. There are plenty of us who have this. Uh, we hear sound a lot like many of us see color. But it does mean we see, we hear the world differently. It's not good or bad, it just is. Consequently, I've spent my life as a neurophysiologist, as a technologist, and as a musician, trying to understand these differences in perception and the brain processes that drive them. As scientists, we spend our lives trying to understand and look for the ways we're the most similar. I truly believe that the innovation leaps and interaction leaps we need to make are going to come from understanding the ways we're the most different. For example, so before my mom passed away, she had macular degeneration. She would say something to me like, I can see, but I can't see. So, it's kind of a nonsensical statement. What do you do with something like that? Uh, macular degeneration typically involves deterioration of the central part of someone's retina. People with it experience a blind spot in their central vision. I get ocular migraines. The types of migraines I get, a wave of innervation travels through my brain, and my brain areas, important for my central vision. When those cells are being innervated by that wave, they can't respond to information in the external world. And I develop a blind spot in my central vision. It looks a lot like this. If you try reading and tracking the yellow dot, you'll see this is, this is a lot like the experience I have. So for 15 minutes a year, when I'm having this type of experience, I see the world as my mom did. In order to see something, I have to look away from it. When she says to me, I can see, but I can't see, I get it. I can empathize, and I change. 
I changed the way I think about innovations to help her life. I spent time building contraptions that magnified what she was looking away from instead of what she was looking at. And I fundamentally think differently about the types of interactions I can have with her to connect. It's this place where a headache and messed up vision that so many we spend our times trying to avoid actually gave me invaluable insight to my mom's world. But it's not always that easy to see both sides. Sometimes we're doing it and we don't even know it. Unfortunately, though, no, truly knowing what someone is hearing, feeling, or seeing is, is difficult. It's difficult to know when it's happening, and even when it is, most of us don't even know how to describe it. But there are people who are really good at describing what they see, and it gives us this opportunity to peek into their sensory world in ways we might not even realize. There's a condition called facial dysmorphopsia. So, People that have facial dysmorphopsia don't see faces naturally. When they're looking at a face, the features appear to move. So everywhere their gaze is directed, they develop a blind spot, and it fills in with nearby information. This gives the illusion of sort of movement of the faces and sort of contorted and distorted figures. Uh, I'm going to show you an example of that. I was only willing to do this to my face. That's why you get to look at me. But, um, <laughs> If you stare at the little cross, I might follow the yellow crosses and you'll sort of get an idea of what this experience might look like for someone with this condition. Okay, so you saw that. It also kind of looks like this. Francis Bacon was a 20th century painter, uh, very well known for painting abstract art that, and portraits that were of contorted sort of uh, distorted figures. It turns out Francis Bacon had a condition that was likely facial dysmorphopsia. So when he was sharing what we look at as art in this case, he was actually representing how he truly saw the world. Monet's water lilies. So this is something I noticed when I was looking at this painting that I, I thought was interesting. So if you stare, I find that when I stare at one of the lilies, and I close one eye, go ahead and do that. I actually, the lily seems to pop out more, almost as if it's in 3D, okay? So I'm not an art historian, art critic, but I am a scientist, and when I see things like this, I, I, got, I had a hypothesis about Monet's vision. Uh, there are different pieces of information, ways that we, uh, cues we take in from the world to be able to know where an object is in space and depth in particular. Uh, some of those cues make use of one eye, we call them monocular. Some of those cues make use of two eyes, and we call them binocular. Cues like color, shading, and occlusion, whether one object's in front of the other. All of those can, we can get from one eye. But cues that require two eyes, uh, something like relative disparity, which is actually a very important cue, uh, require that both eyes are function, functioning normally. So I had a hypothesis that Monet actually couldn't make use of the information coming from both eyes. Turns out, Monet had very bad cataracts. And when you started looking around, his cataracts were so bad that when he was painting water lilies, he actually had one of the cataracts removed. And this is at a time when we didn't replace, when lenses weren't replaced. So Monet couldn't have made use of the information from two eyes, but the information from one eye was likely very developed at making use of that information. So when you look at this painting now, and you look through one eye, you really are seeing it more like Monet. There's a power to seeing both sides, but we don't always get the clairvoyance of the man in Magritte's painting but we can accept and understand the power perspective has on perception. So I'm going to show you an example where something as simple as changing your gaze completely changes how you experience the world. I want you all to look up to the right-hand corner and you're going to, uh, there's some sunlight in the water. And you should see bubbles that are sort of rising up to the surface. If you're staring at that sunlight, those bubbles probably appear to sort of go up and fly off the screen. Uh, does everyone see that? And they fly off the screen kind of at an angle. Now shift your gaze to where the bubbles are. Okay. So now you probably realize those bubbles are going straight up. 
You can go back and forth. Uh, this experience happens because our brain has a con uh, trouble resolving conflicting information about local and global motion. The bubbles have a horizontal grating that's moving across them while they're rising vertically. When your gaze is directed at the bubbles, we can separate them and we can experience them both as they are. But when your gaze is directed away, we experience an integration of that information. It's kind of a cool thing. But, of course, I like to put a bigger message on it, so... There are a few things here. It's the power of perspective. Something as simple as moving my gaze completely changes how I experience what's in front of me. And when I'm, my gaze, when my perspective is directed in one place or another, I can't choose to see it differently even though I've had the experience before. I don't get to. I know it's there, but I can't experience the same way. My perspective determines how I experience it. But I do have the power to choose to know that someone else might be experiencing it that way right now. That is the power of knowing both sides. The human problem is different, and it's, there's a lot of opacity here. We don't always know the state of our biology, and it, our brains constantly change. Yeah. Things like hearing loss or changes in our vision, these are happening all the time to our lower sensory processes, but even things like our environments affect our context and affect our sensitivities, whether we grew up in a village in Afghanistan or a town in the Midwest or in a city like New York or Kathmandu with different pressures. Neuroplasticity helps us take the information that's statistically prevalent and relevant in our environments and make use of it so that we change to adapt to our environments. Things like color, shading, contour, all drive this. Cultural language differences and the categorical boundaries we form can cause us to have different experiences at the most basic level of whether we see green or blue. Some are more obvious, some less so. And sometimes we actually get an opportunity to try on each other's sensory experiences. We did this um, with a pair of arthritis simulation gloves. What we wanted to do here was see if we could take a group of non-designers and give them an empathetic experience of their target user group to work with and whether it would change how they thought about the problem, how would it change their cognitive approach to the problem. The group with the gloves did change. They thought about simplicity in their design. They thought about space. They got rid of things like drop-down menus, which are you know, completely terrible for anyone with digit mobility issues. They changed how they thought about the problem, and they changed what they thought was important. Immersive technologies like augmented and virtual reality are really starting to try to bridge this gap to empathy. In the case of the arthritis gloves, experience was powerful. It gave them an empathetic experience that was actionable in what they did. But we have to go further. We have to go further than just showing experiences. We have to actually engage sensory experiences in a way that is authentic and natural to how our senses interact in the natural world. So let me give you an example of where I re when I realized how powerful that this was if we did this right. Uh, in a, we were developing some, cont some t new technologies, adult imaging technologies, at my company. One of the things we were looking at was the impact of brightness. Just so you realize, uh, a typical display you would have bought three years ago was 300 candelas per square meter. The natural moon is about one to 2,000 candelas. We were looking at luminances much brighter than that. And we were looking at fire content. So we were watching this fire content and something happened. People reacted, I reacted in ways I hadn't predicted. Just by seeing an image of fire and watching this, my body started to expel heat as if it were real. We, took, we could take thermal imaging cameras and measure changes in the temperature on people's faces. We could, the screen wasn't changing, but we were reacting to the content in a way that was natural. In this case, all my brain knew was it had never experienced fire that was that bright 
and wasn't real, so it did what it did best. And just based on the luminance reaching my retina and my knowledge of flame, my body did what it does. If we are going to build experiences to try to bridge and share and gain empathy to each other's experiences, we have to build immersive technologies that bridge this natural sensory experience. So I've been talking a lot about why we should care about empathy and why we need to have empathy. But there is one problem. We don't get empathy unless we make ourselves vulnerable. And we don't like to do that. Beethoven lived in fear that people would find out he was going deaf and losing his hearing. We have more and more outlets, which we all use, where we get to curate who we are and what people see about us. But we know from game theory, Prisoner's Dilemma, Nash Equilibrium, that we end up in a suboptimal state, not as good as we could do if we don't share our vulnerabilities. So to get to the place where we want to be, we have to be able to empathize with others' vulnerabilities, but we also have to be willing to share our own. So the next time you interact with someone and it doesn't make sense to the way you see the world, it challenges it, maybe they challenge you. Rather than assuming they have the same information to make decisions about the world that you do, assume they don't. Assume it's different. Empathy and experience are powerful, and they give us an opportunity to change. We can change our behaviors. We can change our technologies. We can change our assumptions about why someone might be interacting with us in a way that we don't particularly like. We need to change our perspective. If you could see, hear, or feel someone else's alternate reality today and question your own perceptions, what will you change? Thank you.